Welcome to Beyond Perception, where we probably also today embark on a journey of self-discovery. My name is Simon, and I'm very humbled to welcome Timothy Conway again for a second conversation. Timothy, we had a conversation a couple of months ago, and I might just briefly introduce you again. Sure. You had a spiritual awakening at a very early uh, age in your life, became a spiritual seeker, a monk, studied with many great sages, and became a spiritual teacher yourself. And you are sharing about non-dual and Advaita spiritual perspectives for, from what I know, uh, over 40 years now. And um, yeah, it is, a, it is a real pleasure to speak to you again. So uh, welcome very much, um, Timothy. Thank you, Simon. Simon. What's funny is we've already had about an hour, maybe just about 40 minutes of letting the divine speak through us and uh, just celebrate. So the start of this conversation is, uh, feels like just tuning into a conversation that's been going on probably since yeah. before we were born. <laughs> these souls <laughs> two felt... peas in a pod on the podcast or what i was joking the god cast <laughs> it just felt a little bit funny to make an introduction in between a conversation which was already ongoing for quite some time yeah uh, timothy there was one thing i'm very curious about to hear a bit more about your perspective on it. We had this wonderful first conversation where you shared with us about non-dual reality. And uh, within this reality, there seems to be an absolute truth, an absolute perspective, but then also a spectrum of relative perspectives or relative experiences. And in one of your articles, which was very helpful for me to reference my own experience. Uh, you, you write about the three levels of non-dual uh, reality. Um, would you mind to share a little bit about um, what you understand, what you, what, what's your understanding about them and why it might be helpful to, to um, look into these different levels? Well, thank you, Simon. It's a schema or model mm. simply to allow for balance mm. in spiritual life. It's basically the threefold model is an outgrowth of a very old model from India, a twofold model, distinguishing absolute truth mm. prior to space time, all phenomena, all changing events, beings, worlds, this absolute awareness. This is prime. This is absolute. We all have this sense deep down. There's simply a willingness to let go and just be as is with what is. There's a sense of reality, being single, whole, complete, unfragmented. Always the truth prior to the arising of each space-time moment with its changing events and figures, beings, relationships. There's this a priori sense intuitively in this pure, pristine spiritual intuition, the deep jnana or pragna or gnosis, the different words, they all come from that nya, ancient Sanskrit root, meaning the intuitive flashing on this knowing, pure knowing by purely being, the absolute, there's only reality, it has no parts, structure, form, shape, color, texture. And this is the supra personal reality giving rise to all the gazillions of persons, nature spirits, ancestral spirits, high heavenly angelic beings, the more troublesome entities in the cosmos, the 
like Asuras, the Titans, or demons that are interested in using consciousness for power and greed and control and pleasure. And then ghost type beings, hell state kind of beings. And then here we see them visibly on earth, some of those karmas coming in <coughs> to the human realm and the animal realm. These are the six modes of personal existence on the wheel of samsara, the kind of deluded, unconscious, compulsory rebirths, explained the Buddha 2,500 years ago. And pe beings can have different mixes of karma, like a human being could have a certain amount of deva, beautiful deva, heavenly dweller kind of karma, along with maybe some ghost karma. So they would manifest like these beautiful qualities of the devas, of generosity, kindness, radiance, beauty, talent, say beautiful artists or dancers or helpers and servers in the community. But they might have like a ghost karma streak where they feel needy and you know unrequited love and aspects about their past, they kind of haunt, are haunted by that. Or they might have some of the sura karma. They're beautiful, but they can sometimes be kind of ugly with a flash of greediness or anger or lack of empathy, authoritarianism, you know, that kind of thing. Pettiness, cruelty, even callousness, apathy. Those are asura, the demon or titan quality. So people can have different mixes of these. And the teaching is that absolutely there's only one reality here, one divine supra, meta personal intelligence, awareness, beingness that is playing as each of these souls. You know, the one divine actor playing all these roles of all these souls. And the souls are undergoing evolution, cellular evolution, hopefully. And it seems like the divine at the heart of each and every being is impelling a kind of evolution toward being more and more unselfish as the self-realization of the omnipresent self in each and every self gets realized. The cellular evolution happens more quickly and more wholesome qualities get developed, cultivated, and uh, unwholesome qualities of some scars uh, get left off. So the ancient twofold truth model was that there's this absolute reality and then the pragmatic or relative level reality of all these beings, all these worlds, all these happenings. And there was the invitation to experience in an awakening or an enlightening epiphany that there is only this absolute reality, the true self. That ancient Upanishads of India, our oldest non-dual wisdom text called the Brahman and Atman, the divine reality that is the true self, supreme self of all these different selves. So most beings are kind of caught up just in the pragmatic realm, the so-called conventional realm, the truth about reality and its day in, day out, interrelational, complex <laughs> manifestations of organisms, say, on this planet. What I felt the need to insert was an intermediate term between the absolute truth level, the paramartika satya, and this pragmatic uh, samvriti or vyavaharika satya, uh, the relative level truth, the pragmatic level truth. Because it's obvious that from the divine viewpoint, all the souls associated with bodies going through their karmic propensities and unfoldings in interrelationship with fellow beings, whether on earth as a human or animal or in these subtle realms, all the beings and all their experiences and behaviors and relationships are perfect. So I call that a level two truth between level one, there's only the absolute, <laughs> single, whole, complete, unfragmented, prior to and beyond all the worlds and beings and events. 
That's absolute level truth. Pure Godhead, to use medieval Christian language. The pure Ein Sof, to use mystical uh, Jewish language from the Kabbalah. You know, Allah alone, as the Muslim Sufis would say, La ilaha illallah, 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 nothing but God, nothing but God. That's the absolute level truth of the Supreme Brahman, Atman, as the ancient Upanishads revealed. And what the Buddha speaks of as the unborn, uncompounded, unmade, without which there is no liberated liberation from that which is born, compounded, and made. The deathless, the unchanging, as the Buddha affirmed. So that's absolute level truth. We'll call it level one. Level three would be the pragmatic level of all the beings and right and wrong and helpful and harmful and male and female and positive charge and negative charge in an atom or you know, among ions. Level two inserted between is this realization that all the multiplicity, all the relativity, all the beings are from the divine view, perfect, exquisitely, perfect in their suchness as what the divine has perfectly scripted for that soul or these souls in a given moment, a given situation. And that level two seems wrong. Like when you're reading the newspapers or online and reading about like Vladimir Putin invading Ukraine, you know, with his young, mainly young conscripted troops that didn't want to fight their neighbors in Ukraine. And so many of them are defecting and, you know, in wars, rapes, uh, so yeah, husband abusing his wife, battering his wife or beating up his children, getting drunk, maybe beating up his kids, these kind of horrible evils. You can't say this is perfect. You can't say this is perfectly scripted. There has to be this pragmatic level three addressing injustices with the spirit and power of promoting justice. Hmm. So many of our great heroes have engaged spirituality, spirituality that realizes it's not complete to just mystically realize the transcendent beyond all, prior to all. Pure, 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 pure divinity, pure spirit. That's just one aspect of spiritual life is this sudden awakening and real abidance as absolute awareness. The ever free, unborn, undying, unchanging, unmoving <laughs> reality. For full balance in spiritual life, there must be be not just this mystical spirituality of realizing the true I, 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 the true self beyond all, the pristine spiritual reality. There must also be this engaged spirituality of finding the transcendent self imminently within each being and situation. And that demands goodness and justice and kindness and love and unselfish generosity. So authentic spirituality is this mm, beautifully non-dual, but inclusive, apparently dual principles, but they're included non-dually of total quiescence, transcendence, formlessness, and total engagement, divine imminence, dancing with forms and beings and worlds and situations, knowing that it's all just the one reality, doing everything and being everyone. But the realization that the, the relative level, the so-called conventional level, the pragmatic level of beings and their situations and the ethics and morality of what happens, intentions and behaviors and consequences. The realization of all this doesn't just always have to bring up 
a sense of the problematic and the various problems to be solved through progressive movements, progressive political movements, justice movements, you know, racial justice, environmental justice, justice for the poor, the needy, justice on behalf of women, women's rights, because traditionally they've been so oppressed by us males. You know. If you're very involved in the pragmatic level, the pragmatic level of justice and progressively trying to solve individually and collectively solve the pressing dire problems, and there's actually so many, it's very easy to burn out just on mm -hmm. one issue, mm -hmm. like climate change, it'd be very easy to burn out. When you realize, for instance, the number one solution that individuals can do is go to a plant-based diet. And then you listen to most of the so-called climate change experts and only about 10% of them ever even mention changing your diet. Whereas we have all these scientific studies emerging in the last dozen years saying humans must change their diet if there's to be any hope for higher life forms on this planet. We must go 80, 90% vegan, you know, largely plant-based. So, you know, you could just burn out on that one issue of why aren't people adopting <laughs> a plant-based diet? It's the solution many, many scientists now have identified as the number one thing that individuals, and then collectively, if there were public education, we could shift away from the meat and dairy industries, but that's the problem. The meat and dairy industries are so powerful, so wealthy, they own most of the politicians in most of the developed nations. So those politicians won't speak. And uh, many climate experts, you know, they are so just into their thing of it's the bad, evil oil and gas industries, the fossil fuel industries. They've been harping on that for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, but that's all they look at. And they don't look at all these other solutions. Another solution is food waste. Mm -hmm. People throw away massive amount of food and then it generates all this methane. <laughs> so back to the larger point. As you get involved on the pragmatic level three of trying to advance justice for beings, for sentient beings, it's very easy to just burn out if you're just trying to push against the forces of inertia, the status quo, so-called conservative, usually right wing, heavily economically, financially invested in making sure everything stays exactly the same way because it's so lucrative even if it's destroying all life on the planet. Oh, the bottom line on our quarterly profits, you know, reports the CEO or chief financial officer, the CFO, you know, it's like business as usual. They just want to keep that going. And so they basically fund all these right-wing politicians to make sure that that stays the same. And it drives environmental justice advocates crazy. So on level three, it's very easy to burn out and to get too caught up in like, who are the evil perpetrators mm. of evil? And who are the good guys? And then it gets very factional, very divisive, very dualistic. So we need this level two in between level one of only God, only the absolute right now, spaceless, timeless, prior to each arising moment, there's only the open, infinite clarity of the divine spirit, our true nature, our absolute nature. This is the absolute level truth, paramartika satya, satya truth, param meaning beyond. Uh, so a lot of beings get caught between shifting between level one, if they've begun to open up to mystical spirituality, but then feeling pulled by a kind of moral ethical gravity to not just be checked out as some kind of zombie, just, oh, it's all God, it's all God, it's all God. <laughs> You know, but actually be a responsive, mm -hmm. response able, able to respond, member of a, a family, a, a couple relationship, mm -hmm. a community, a nation, a planet. And uh, speaking out for the voiceless, the animals, the children, the unborn children who will have to live in the world, the meat and dairy eaters and food wasters and oil and gas mongers uh, created. It's imperative that we also find this level two between level one and level three, and they're all inclusive. They're all simultaneously mm -hmm. true perspectives. 
of seeing that whatever happens is somehow perfect. And we have to bring in like literature and drama for that. We know that in tremendous classical comedy, which has a fantastically happy ending, along the way there's various problems and conflicts and you know, really <laughs> edgy, threatening kind of situations for the beings. But in classic comedy, everyone comes to a happy ending, including the so-called villains, the evil doers. They have this great transformation and become uh, beautiful beings. They become unselfish. <laughs> like I was sharing with you this story of Ebenezer Scrooge and the ghost of his former greedy partner, Jacob Marley. And Marley comes back with his chains, dragging all these chains, uh, saying, Ebenezer, Ebenezer Scrooge, look, look what I am, a ghost suffering and dragging my chains. You have the chance to change before you become like me upon death. You know, a wandering, suffering ghost, you know, deep pain. And Ebenezer Scrooge uh, says, well, Jacob, what are all those chains you're dragging? He says, I forged these through my years of greed and being a selfish human being. And Ebenezer Scrooge says, but Jacob, you were a great man of business. And Marley kind of interrupts and kind of screams, exclaims, mankind was my business. Mankind was my business. And I ignored them, I neglected them. And Ebenezer Scrooge winds up again experiencing the angels or ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future. And uh, he has to have this amazing life review of what he's been up to in the past and the present and what his life will be in the future if he doesn't wake up and change, become a part of the current of goodness and kindness and love instead of hatred and greed and stinginess and apathy, callousness. And those angels and Christmas past, present, and future do appear to him through the night of Christmas Eve and by the morning he's a totally transformed being. So in that transformation, one realizes that all of one's evil and one begins to see the so-called evil of so-called evil beings. It's just a temporary manifestation. And you see from the kind of God's viewpoint you know, how each soul, it might start off very imperfect, very ugly, very accrual, evil soul, but there are going to be things. The divine self is working within the soul and in relationships with that soul and things that happen in the world. It's all for unfolding the cellular evolution over time, just like there is cellular evolution on a biological level. And you could look at embryology in a mother's womb, a little one cell becomes two cells and mm -hmm. so forth. And then they become differentiated cells. There's like this embryological evolution from the simple to the complex and elegant and more fully developed. So also with souls, there's a cellular evolution. And level two realization in spiritual life is this trust, this profound faith that all souls are being unfolded, evolved, developed on the divine schedule. And we never know when a being of tremendous evil can suddenly wake up. Like the fictional character of Ebenezer Scrooge in Charles Dickens' classic work, The Christmas Carol, again, which was a work of literature that he wrote, but it wound up being filmed, gosh, over a dozen times, 15, 20 times since then. Often in other countries like India, they've taken that story and run with it in uh, their cinema. So when you realize that all beings are awakening, and from the God's view, you see that the awakening has always already been true. <laughs> and it's only on level three that they appear as a being in space time, chronological time. And they might seem far less evolved 
which is rudimentarily evolved. We can trust that on level two, what they are is a pure emanation soul. Their soul is in perfection right now because made of God, sourced in God, their substance is God, the divine mm -hmm. truth, goodness, beauty. Satyam, Shivam, Sundaram, as they say in Sanskrit. Truth, goodness, and beauty. But on level one, we realize there's nothing has ever happened. <laughs> there are no beings. There are no worlds. There's only God, only God, only God. So I realize that a balanced spiritual life involves simultaneously all these perspectives. You're utterly transcendent, yet fully imminent and involved as a being among beautiful beings in this striving for progressive justice and on an individual level allowing all the beautiful virtues of loving kindness and empathetic compassion, sympathetic joy, and peaceful equanimity and generosity and unselfish service. You're allowing all that to happen. On level two, you see that it's always already perfect. Whatever happens, even the flaws and glitches of being a being, a sentient being, under various stresses and so forth, you see that it's exactly what's perfectly scripted by the divine for this moment, this situation. In level one, you realize that Zen says not a single thing from the very beginning. <laughs> only the Buddha nature, only God, only spirit. Clear, pure, vast, subtler than subtle, infinite, timelessly eternal. Not any kind of thing. And so right now, you are not a human being. You are not anything like a human being. You are the absolute awareness. Formless spirit. And... You are a pure emanation soul, exquisite with all the endowed divine beauty and virtue. And level three, you're a soul associated with a body mind and there's certain wholesome and unwholesome samskaras or personal consciousness tendencies. And there's relationships to be honored in your family, community, nation, planet, among species. Let there be justice, let there be goodness, let there be ethical, moral maturity. Let all selfish, unwholesome tendencies be outgrown. That's a level three teaching for waking up ethically, morally, psychologically, and spiritually from being a selfish, nasty, gnarly being, <laughs> very contracted and tight, uptight with me, myself, and my, and opening up as this gorgeous bud and flower, so fragrant, so beautiful, full of virtues. And that's why we celebrate the great sages and saints, Jesus the Christ, the Buddha, various sages of India, East and West, North, South, male, female. As you know, I focused a lot on female holiness in history because no one else had really focused on it extensively. But, so uh, to realize all this is full spirituality. And that's why we love the saints and sages and Buddhas and Jesus, because they manifested on a level three level of spirituality, the perfection that we intuit about every soul on level two. So to live this triple perception of spiritual life, let's balance. If you ignore one, two, or three, there's imbalance. And let me just say one last thing about that model, which is level one is absolutely singular. <laughs> it's absolutely absolute. 
Level two and level three have to do with the multitude of souls and situations, and that's relative, it's multiplistic, uh, not absolute. Relative. But the divine is manifesting as the relative level and all your relatives <laughs> <laughs> and all beings and situations and permutations of experience and behavior. So this is the only model I felt could properly account for all aspects of spiritual living, mystical transcendent spirituality and this more imminent divine engaged spirituality and then the perfection of whatever is happening in the multiplistic realms of phenomena, which are like a dream, because the divine dreamer is conjuring them all up out of nothingness. This allows for real freedom and real balance and a maturity and clarity that uh, is not subject to delusion. Because if you get imbalanced, delusion sets in. And there can be, uh, like say, social justice warriors forget the absolute mm. and they become very dualistic and contentious and are always looking for who are the evildoers, all the ones committing injustice on this planet, you know, mm. or the devil, Satan, that's the ultimate evil one. And there's all this dualism and fear and paranoia and mm. so forth that can set in among, say, right wing fundamentalist types and Christianity or Islam certain other traditions. So there needs to be this realization, it's all God. There's only the divine here playing as all these beings. Every night in deep dreamless sleep, for instance, everyone drops all sense of personhood, relationship, the dualisms, functional or dysfunctional <laughs> dualities. And we just abide as pure, absolute being, awareness, bliss. That's how beings get restored and regenerated. If you deprive someone of deep, dreamless sleep, you, mm. you'll kill them within several mm. days or a week or two. They discovered that with, unfortunately, <laughs> placed little laboratory animals back in the 1950s at the Stanford University sleep laboratories. And then it's used as a torture technique like the US <laughs> U.S. Uh, military forces and covert ops forces used uh, sleep deprivation on prisoners, many of whom we found out were innocent. There's no reason they should have been suspects, but they were subjected to that. So it's a divine grace that beings do have deep dreamless sleep period. <laughs> it allows the whole body mind to get mm -hmm. restored and the dreaming function of sleep especially helps the mental restoration. It's the deep dreamless sleep, uh, you know, stage three and four dreamless sleep that allows for the regeneration of the body and subtle energy body. So beings know that everything disappears and that there's only God in a sense. God is their continuity when they wake up in the morning. God is providing the continuity of the personhood because the personhood utterly disappeared in deep dreamless sleep for a few hours at least each night. So we all know on some level this is true. And as for like the level two, it's all perfect. In an interview I gave for a national magazine called The Sun Magazine back in 2003, the interviewer Arnie Cooper, who had heard me share in satsang, uh, in the Santa Barbara area of California. He asked if he could do an interview for that national magazine. And I laid all of this out and I've reproduced that interview in, uh, at our website, the enlightened-spirituality.org website. Uh, just do a search on like the three levels of truth. And as part of that long compilation page, I, I included that section of the long interview because I went into it in depth. A kind of a proof for level two that it's all perfect is actually looking at the physical cosmos itself. Because there's all these amazing, amazing fine tunings that have to be precisely in place. Precisely in place. Sometimes involving like a hairbreadth of a difference that's like trillions of a trillionth of a trillionth perfectly balanced 
parameters, like the relation between matter and antimatter at the initial material developing phase of the physical cosmos before it was just an energy ball. And before that, it was this virtual particle arising out of the prime no thingness. Scientists are now very clear. Helen Guth and Andre Linde won the Nobel Prize. Guth wrote a book back in 1997 called The Inflationary Universe, this pre-Big Bang inflationary moment of virtual particles somehow spontaneously manifests out of the void, the pure nothingness. But it expands as an energy ball to, even though there's, it's defining the creation of space-time, they think it's relative to us, the size of a soccer ball. Now, if it had moved a little bigger, like the size of a basketball, or only the size of a grapefruit, you wouldn't have a physical cosmos. <laughs> but it gives rise to this energy radiation phenomenon or set of phenomena. And as it cools and congeals a little more, it develops matter and antimatter. And the relationship between matter and antimatter is so precise. It involves a decimal point, like 1.000000. I think it's something like 22 places <laughs> out is the next one. <laughs> so it's not like 1.1 1 .1 to 1 or 1.01 to 1, the ratio between matter and antimatter. It's not 1.0001 to 1. It's this number that's like one point and something like 22 zeros and a 1 to 1 for antimatter. If you move that decimal point way out there, if you just move it one place to the right or the left, you don't have a physical cosmos. <laughs> There's, I identified about 19 or maybe it was 22 of these incredibly fine-tuned parameters that blew the minds of the scientists who've been working on these problems for decades. And they all believe in some kind of super intelligence, some kind of divine reality that's orchestrating everything. Fred Hoyle, who actually came up with the name kind of sarcastically, Big Bang, to describe this uh, cosmos originating from what they at the time thought was an infinitely dense, infinitely massive, infinitely hot point. But now with the inflationary moment, we realize what came before that singularity was not infinitely dense, hot. It was pure no thingness, immaterial. The material cosmos arises from an immaterial source. Fred Hoyle, who was studying the internal chemistry of second and third and later generation stars. You know, first generation stars are very simple, just hydrogen and helium. In fact, most of the physical cosmos is just hydrogen and helium. But in second generation stars, the ones that formed from the star stuff of first generation stars that exploded and died or imploded and died, <clears throat> the second generation stars made of the star stuff of the first generation of stars in the physical cosmos, the second generation stars, they generate heavier elements beyond hydrogen and helium within their core. Fred Hoyle, who was studying this in the 1950s, 60s, he was an atheist, but his mm -hmm. mind was blown. And he said, I totally believe there is some kind of super intellect that is obviously monkeyed with the basic laws of chemistry, physics, and probably biology as well. And if you talk to the biologists at the forefront of their fields, they are dazzled, whether it's the origin of life or how embryology happens in a mother's womb after the conception you know, of a sperm and egg cell. It's utterly miraculous. A whole set of phenomena that occur that are just so mind-blowing there have been many books written about this. Uh, unfortunately, editors of news magazines and newspapers and online and things, they, uh, they, as a profession, are disproportionately agnostic or atheist. And so they often bring on scientists like Stephen, the late Stephen Hawking and others that are atheist or agnostic. But surveys have been done 
most scientists who were working in the basic fields of physics, chemistry, biology, and all of their subdivisions, when asked, you know, do you believe in the divine reality on the basis of what you see? Something like 70, 80, 90% of them in the surveys will say yes. Mm -hmm. So right there is kind of a proof for level two that somehow there is this divine principle orchestrating everything. And we trust and have faith that it means that all souls are being perfected by divine perfection. It may look like a very imperfect process, very evil in many cases, like with wars and again, rapes, a husband getting drunk, beating his wife and children. That, that's just evil. You know, these shooters and 18 year old shooters, we just had two of them in the last few weeks, go in and slay a bunch of African Americans in an African American neighborhood. And then another one go and slay a bunch of little 10 year old children and a couple of their teachers, one of whom was found trying to protect the other children with her body against the shooter. She was protecting these children. She's courageous and unselfish to the end. You know, we, we look at these horrors, these evils, the Nazi Holocaust, the, uh, what the Chinese have done to the Tibetans, what Pol Pot, uh, as a rabble rouser created in Cambodia in the 70s, slaughtering one third of the population, you know. Uh, what we've done in Afghanistan, 95, 98% of the people were starving to death over there as a result of our failed meddling. You know, what we did in Iraq back in the 1990s, up until the 2003 second war, we launched, Bush Sr. and then Clinton launched these draconian sanctions on the country so they couldn't get the chemistry to uh, filter and clean water. So they had no clean water, no medicines, over five, 600,000 children died. The Secretary of State at the time, Madeleine Albright, was confronted by journalist Leslie Stahl. We hear that over 500,000 children have died, let alone the infirm, the elderly, and all sorts of other people. It was various reports was like 1.2 million Iraqis, innocent civilians, died because of US imposed sanctions just because we had this whole political game against Saddam Hussein, who used to be our man in the Middle East. We funded and armed him you know, to fight the war against the Iranians after the 1979 revolution. Throughout the 1980s, Saddam Hussein was our man in Iraq, standing up against those evil fundamentalist Muslim Iranians. But then in 1990, W. Herbert Walker Bush, our first Bush president, mm was goaded by Margaret Thatcher to not look so wimpy and stand up and prove his manliness. And he did it by declaring war on Saddam. But what he really did was declare war on the Iraqi people who were already suffering under Saddam, a madman who ran the worst police state on the planet at that point. And so 1.2 million people died, innocent civilians. And again, about 500,000 children. And Leslie Stahl asked Madeleine Albright in a sit down televised interview, you know, we hear that over 500,000 children have died because of US imposed sanctions on Iraq. Do you think the price is worth it? And Madeleine Albright said, yes, we think the price is worth it to control Saddam Hussein. That's evil, that's just evil. We trust and have faith that all the souls that died and were suffering were being attended to by angels. And that those periods of starvation or disease that could have easily been treated if the US had allowed medicines through like basic anti-diarrheal uh, medications, uh, you know, which turned into dysentery because they didn't have the medication and they die from it or suffer grievous harm if they survive. We trust that somehow all of this is meant to happen. Otherwise, something else would have happened. Because nothing happens except through and by the power of this great absolute divine reality that allows anything to happen. That's dreaming all this right now, conjuring all these manifestations out of nothingness and vanishing a moment 
by moment by moment. Everything is vanishing, including suffering of pain and enjoyment of pleasure. <laughs> it's all vanishing. It's always free and clear reality, absolute. And the awakening of all beings, what early Christianity even had a word for, apokatastasis. It's a Greek word, apokatastasis. It means the universal awakening or salvation or redemption of all beings because God's love, being the absolute reality, dreaming and conjuring everything, God's love will eventually awaken all beings to divine love. That's a level two teaching. It's all perfect because all beings are intrinsically perfect and being on perfect divine schedule, being awakened to perfection and the relationships are all healed and made perfect. So that's a level two multiplistic teaching that it's all perfect, but it's part of the overall balance. Only God and the vast multitude of gazillions of beings emanated by the one divine are all perfect. And on level three, <laughs> they're all working out their perfection perfectly. <laughs> perfection perfecting itself perfectly <laughs> with a lot of apparent grievous imperfections, evils and injustices. Allowing this triple view, again, one absolute truth, and these two relative truths of the divine perfection and the multiplicity, and then the urging, striving, struggle for justice and perfection on level three, the pragmatic level. To live this balance uh, allows real freedom and maturity and not shirking, ignoring or neglecting Hmm. Any aspect of reality allows one to be very involved, say, in social, environmental, gender, racial injustices, speciesist injustices against animals, without burning out. Hmm. I think in that 2003 interview with Arnie Cooper, yeah, uh, at one point I cited how the American <clears throat> spiritual teacher Ram Dass the former Harvard psychologist, Richard Alpert, he became Ram Dass mm -hmm. in India under his guru, Neem Karoli Baba. It's often misspelled Neem Karoli Baba, but in India they spell it Neem Karoli Baba. Mm -hmm. And one day Ram Dass was asking Neem Karoli Baba about all the suffering and evil and injustice on the planet. You know, he came from a strong progressive Jewish background and a Jewish sense of Zedek, justice. You know, and God will be enacting justice, so be careful about your ethical, moral imperfections and grievous flaws, shortcomings. So Ramdas asked Nib Korari about all the injustices of the world, all the suffering and evil, and all the suffering that's created by the evil. And Nib Korari said, Ramdas, Suffering is perfect. Hmm. And Ramdas was shocked. He was like, you know, wheels were turning in his mind to figure out how to rebut or argue against that point. Hmm. Again, how do you say that the Nazi Holocaust, six and the scholars, and I think it's over six million Jews died during the Nazi pogroms and massacres and the shtetls, the death marches, the concentration camps and gas chambers? I think over six million people died. Jews, not to mention gypsies and the Roma people and homosexuals and political dissidents. Over six million people within several years. So Ram Dass is trying to come up with an argument against his guru, a very powerful spiritual fellow, Neb Karoli Baba. Hmm. Neb Karoli is just a Ram Dass suffering or evil is perfect. Ramdas is scrambling. And then before he can come out with anything, Nim Kodali says, and Ramdas, your endeavors to end suffering are also perfect. It's balance. Nim Kodali gave a level two teaching. Hmm. Suffering is perfect. But he also gave a pragmatic level three teaching. All your endeavors, attempts, strivings to end suffering and injustice and shelter and help and heal beings 
That's all mm. part of the divine perfection too. And the teaching is that ultimately it's all a divine comedy, not a tragedy. No souls are left out. That was that amazing <laughs> apocatastasis doctrine in early Christendom, which turned out it was apparently widespread. There's a website you can go to, apocatastasis.org, I think it is, or .com, .org, <clears> that talks about how widespread it was. I always thought it was just several theologians were advancing it, like Origen and Clement of Alexandria and some others. And of course, it was the old teaching of the Upanishads and the Buddha and Lord Krishna and the Bhagavad Gita. The Eastern traditions are very clear that all beings will awaken. It's the Brahma or Vedanta Sutra says a work that basically uh, summarizes the gist of all the ancient Upanishads, those original non-dual wisdom texts for humanity. And they were oral scriptures first. They only got written down hundreds of years later. The Brahma or Vedanta Sutra says all beings will awaken to divine reality, Brahman, because there is only Brahman. <laughs> <laughs> Krishna says the same thing to Arjuna before the great battlefield slaughter. You know, on the Kurukshetra battlefield, he tells Arjuna, you know, I, the true omnipresent self, the divine principle, am in all your friends and loved ones, your colleagues on the side of good, and I am in all your evil enemies, your cousins who've turned toward evil so fully. I alone am playing as all these. No one slays and no one is slain. That's a level two teaching. It's about the multiplicity of all the beings, but it's saying no one dies and no one kills them. So it's a level two teaching about how it's all perfect. And all beings will come to me. Like the Buddha had said, all beings will wake up because all phenomenal conditions that appear to keep them locked in their selfish samskaras in the rounds of rebirth, the rounds of samsara, the unwholesome samskaras fuel the compulsory rebirth rounds we call samsara. The Buddha said all those conditions, causes and conditions are just contingent and ephemeral. They're not ultimately real. And so he's basically teaching your true nature wakes up because there is only the awake Buddha nature, absolutely. Everything else is just relative, conditional, ephemeral, anicca, not permanent, but passing, and anatta, which doesn't mean no person or no self, but anatta means all of the causes and conditions and the aggregates of personhood and bodily states, mental, emotional, psychological states, and the very sense of being a me, these are not Mine, these are not who I am, these are not my true self. Nitamama, ne so hamas me, na me so ata, says the Buddha throughout the Pali canonical literature, Pali language, canon of Buddhist scripture, all those uh, suttas, sutras in Buddhist Sanskrit, of the Buddha speaking. That's one of the, the most common refrains. Is, all of the aggregates, the phenomena of the pragmatic realms, including the subtle realms, deva and asura and ghost and hell realms, as well as human and animal, all of these causes and conditions and aggregates of personhood for beings in these realms, he deconstructs them and says they're dreamlike. They don't have real substance because they're passing and therefore, because they're passing and therefore insubstantial like a dream, they're not worth clinging to. And so one awakens from personhood, but it doesn't say there's no persons, mm -hmm. <laughs> no selves. Uh, the Buddha loves persons. He has, and he encourages his followers, let there be the love of a, a zillion mothers just as one mother has this amazing love for her baby, you, O oh listeners of this true Dhamma or Dharma teaching, may you have the love of a million or zillion mothers toward every being you encounter, high or low, good or evil. See them all with the infinite 
empathetic compassion and loving kindness of a mother, a divine mother. <laughs> so that's balance. The Buddha always showed us this balance of wisdom and compassion. The wisdom sees through all, deconstructs all, says this is all just a dream. But the compassion is, wow, what a dream. Let there be the divine abodes or virtuous qualities, the chatur brahma vihara, the four divine qualities of loving kindness, metta, empathetic, compassion, karuna, sympathetic joy for the beings in their temporarily joyous, happy states, mudita, upeka, the great peaceful equanimity for all beings that they may awaken to their true nature as these pure souls and even awaken beyond being a pure soul to the single Buddha nature, the absolute, the unborn, uncompounded, undying reality without which there is no liberation from that which is merely born, you know, phenomenal, compounded, changing and dying. Ah, but oh listeners, oh almsmen and almswomen and laity, said the Buddha, there is this unborn, unmade, uncompounded, undying, radical truth, absolute awareness. And a later Buddhist development really wanted to explore the ramifications of that against certain Buddhist historical movements that had arisen that only were emphasizing deconstructive, disidentifying side. You know, everything is just a dream. <laughs> everything is merely shunyata, empty. Better translation actually is open, open for the absolute, <laughs> transparent for the absolute. But this later Buddhist movement that actually didn't arise that late, it arose kind of just around the same time as these more deconstructive reductionist movements, Majamika and its narrow interpretation later. And the school I'm talking about is called Tathagata Garba. <clears throat> Tathagata Garba Buddhism. And they came up with some scriptures and their teachers said, yes, all phenomena are just a dream. They are impermanent. In, therefore insubstantial, therefore not worth clinging to, or dukkha, usually try to translate it as suffering, or just dissatisfactoriness. But these Tathagata Garbha school Buddhas said, we don't just emphasize the impermanence and substantiality and dissatisfactoriness of phenomena. We also affirm by just being spontaneously the absolute Buddha nature truth. <clears throat> which is eternal, permanent, <laughs> not like a mere dream, but utterly substantial as the one substance, the one reality, playing as all these causes and conditions and worlds and beings. And this is sukha, not dukkha. This is bliss, ananda, sukha, bliss, supreme Buddha nature, <laughs> joy, satisfaction, pleasure, but it's not dualistic. It's spontaneous, non-dual, ever free, non-phenomenal. Again, spiritual balance. Buddha taught, you are not merely the aggregates of personhood. You are the absolute unborn Buddha nature. And as far as the aggregates of personhood goes, let there be infinite, endless compassion, total engagement, total non-dual resonance and empathy with all beings, each and every being, each and every situation for beings. And that's why the Buddha was a Buddha, because he wasn't just tranced out as a zombie, you know, who, the people that have tried to reductionistically and nihilistically define Nibbana as this kind of extinction, 
the Buddha identifies that as a heresy. Just like eternalism, thinking the ego is permanent and eternal. That was the heresy of eternalism. The heresy of nihilism, he clearly identifies in a number of places in the oldest, most authentic literature of Buddha's discourses and conversations. This middle way is between naive eternalism, thinking that you can reify or thingify the ego and the body and the mind and me, you know, that's a naive eternalism, naive realism. It tries to reify phenomena, thingify phenomena, make them more solid than they are. But the opposite heresy, which he thought was very dangerous, and so did people like Nagarjuna, who taught shunyata, openness, emptiness. Uh, and some of his followers kind of misinterpreted his teachings, and they became very nihilistic. You know, they were denying personhood and phenomena. But the Buddha is saying, disidentify from phenomena so there can be this totally compassionate, engaged re-identification. And I was sharing with someone recently in Israel, <laughs> Jessica Eve, uh, the dangers of neo or pseudo Advaita which is very reductionistic and has this very nihilistic teaching of no person, no self. It's a complete misunderstanding of what the Buddha and the Upanishads and all the great teachers and textual, truly enlightened textual traditions since then were trying to communicate. They're not saying there's no person, no self. They're saying what you are as the absolute is not merely personhood. Personhood is included included in your vast host nature, your subtler than subtle non-phenomenal host nature as the suprapersonal reality is conjuring up all these gazillions of persons. <laughs> the absolute suprapersonal reality obviously loves personing as persons because there's so many gazillions of them, humans, animals, ancestral spirits, all the beings of the subtle realms, the devas and asuras and ghosts and hell dwellers. And all those states are impermanent. The Buddha says even the hell dwellers and even the asuras will wake up. In his life, he converted a very terrible asura in human form, one of those highway robbers who would not hesitate to kill people just to extract the gold out of their teeth or out of their purse. You know, Angulimala was his name. And the Buddha confronted him on the road and people behind the Buddha, walking behind him, thought, you know, oh God, that's that terrible, evil murderer, Angulimala. The Buddha is going to meet an early death. The nation will be deprived of his teachings. <laughs> what happened? The Buddha converted Angulimala and he became a converted spiritual aspirant and within days became an arhat, a perfected, awake being. So, <laughs> again, all states are impermanent. You could be a demon. One moment, an hour later, you could be like a shining deva, uh, totally outgrowing, seeing off all the evil tendencies and a radical, life-changing epiphany, <laughs> like happened to Ebenezer Scrooge in Charles Dickens' classic work of literature, The Christmas Carol. So you see how all these three levels work and interpenetrate and all can be it must be included for a truly balanced spirituality that of penetrating wisdom and all embracing compassion and love, kindness, empathy. Our teacher Sri Nizar Gadatta said spirituality, I was sharing this with Jessica the other day. He said spirituality is like this two-step dance, total authentic disidentification as the transcendent prior to all, beyond all absolute awareness prior to the whole universal play of consciousness and the play of the individual personal consciousness and realizes the transcendent absolute awareness. This is full authentic disidentification, being nobody, no thing, not anything, formless, shapeless, pristine spirit, unborn, unchanging. And 
Maharaj says the two-step dance is full disidentification and full spontaneous re-identification as all beings and each and every being in great uh, clarity and charity, as he would say. We're clear about our true nature and yet spontaneously involved in charitable giving and helping and serving. And that was his life. All he did was share, even at the end, last year and a half or two, when he had that terrible throat cancer. All he could do was just share with beings. It must have been agonizing for the body. It was. To keep sharing, but it kept happening because of the spontaneous goodness, the love that he spoke about, that when you transcend personhood, then you are free to be a person for the sake mm. of love. Mm and interrelationship. Hmm. So beings, I, I know there's beings that feel somehow are called to, hmm. are called to go into some kind of retreat or seclusion, leave a re spousal relationship or family or community and go off and be the alone unto the alone. <laughs> And that may happen for a time, but it's all for the sake of coming back mm. as the world of beings. Mm. Mm. Notice I didn't say coming back into the world because the world is in you, the absolute awareness that all arises moment by vanishing moment. Moments are always vanishing. The world is always vanishing, vanishing, vanishing. But it's arisings and vanishings all happen in thou, O oh absolute awareness. When you realize this, there's no need to leave relationship or family or community and go off somewhere because every place is the same place <laughs> here. <laughs> every scenario, whether they're human beings or animals or angelic beings and or demons appearing, like some of the great saints, sages who put up with demon attacks and finally realize they're all transparent for God like Padre Pio and St. Anthony the Great and Milarepa of Tibet, I don't realize all the asuras are transparent for the divine. Uh, it's just our fear and vulnerability that makes us feel vulnerable and separate from them. So if you wake up to the true transcendent reality, you are transcending even in the midst of the apparent play of space-time and all its manifestations and disguises of situations and beings. So that's how that tension between, should I leave the world? You know, mm. Again, it may feel totally appropriate to have kind of a clearing time, but it's not for its own sake. That's why that Bodhisattva ideal, or the ideal of the Buddha, a living, true living Buddha coming back from transcendence into the realm of immanence. It's like that old Chan Zen saying, uh, I forget the name of the old Chan master, Tang Dynasty, who came up with it. You know, first, there are mountains and rivers. Then there are no mountains and rivers. That's the deconstruction, disidentification phase. And then there are mountains and rivers. <laughs> and it's all non-dual. At first, you felt that mountains and rivers were these things, these kind of solid like phenomena, you know, and you were the separate perceiver, experiencer, sufferer, enjoyer, you know. And then there's the realization it's all dreamlike, it's all just consciousness. There are no mountains, no rivers. Fundamentally, there's only consciousness and it's dynamic energy, you know. Chit Shakti, consciousness energy. That's all there is. But no, so the sages, that's not complete. Finally, and then there are mountains and rivers again, and all the beings, sentient beings. But there's no dualism anymore. You realize you are each being. Hmm. You realize the omnipresent self. The Chan and Zen masters also <clears throat> came up with various schema to describe like spiritual stages of awakening. And the first uh, schema that was developed, and they would paint them, these old Chinese landscape painters, they would paint these gorgeous 
works in uh, ink and uh, paper with water. And in the earliest phases, there was like eight, there were different schemas, six stages and eight stages, 10 and 12. In the early ones, they <clears throat> would end with the, the void of the circle, just absolute transcendence. But in the more, we would say mature and balanced schema, and there was a few famous painters in China and Japan that came up with these. It was the eighth stage that there was the big Zen circle, open void shunyata. In the ninth image, flower branches and blossoms and birds and the trees and sky are reappearing. And then in the 10th image, the young ox herd boy who has been following a, a wild ox through the hillside and trying to get better glimpses and study the nature of the ox, and then finally trying to tame and ride the ox. All of these images like image one, two, three, four, five, six, and so forth are about the young ox herd boy becoming an ox herder and herding this ox and taming it and riding it. It's a metaphor for mastering the body, mind, ego, G, <laughs> and psychological self tendencies, the unwholesome samskaras and becoming more wholesome and, and adept in virtue and spirituality and so forth. And in the kind of enlightened perception as you wake up. And one of the last images before the void, the big circle, is the ox herd boy has mastered this ox and is confidently riding the ox. You know, he is in a sense an adept having mastered a lot of the body, mind, ego, relational world phenomena kind of scenarios, then it all disappears. He transcends and the flower branches and blossoms and birds and bugs are all reappearing. And in the last image, the 10th ox herding picture, the boy has come down from the hillside, down from the mountain, along kind of arm in arm or hand in hand with the famous laughing Buddha, uh, Putai, or Hote as he's known in Japan, Putai in China, the big fat bellied laughing Buddha with his walking staff. He's an enlightened Chan Buddhist monk. So the young Oxford boy is coming back to the marketplace in the village or town with Putai, Hotai, the laughing Buddha. And uh, the caption usually given is returning to the marketplace with bliss bestowing hands. And it signifies that full circle Chan or Zen realization of formlessness. And then form is arising again, mountains and rivers are arising again, but not in a dualistic separatist way. It's all non-dual. You are everything and everyone. And you are no thing, no one, nobody. You are pure transcendent spirit. I think that long winded explanation of the threefold model, <laughs> 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 which unfortunately kept Simon silent during all this time. <laughs> That's mm. what allows for spiritual balance and freedom and flowing. Mm glowing as my friend thomas rosetta <laughs> says glow with the flow <laughs> mm, i like that <laughs> yeah yeah infinitely mystical.com website thomas rosetta there's a long time attender attendee at our satsang is beautiful beautiful i think of him as a young man he might be my age but he looks 20 years younger. <laughs> <laughs> you could have him on your podcast sometime, a dear, delightful being. Oh, I know no. I've recommended some other friends like Yurun Wienenbos, a young sage from uh, living in Germany, from uh, 
Holland originally, and my dear friend John Prendergast, old yes. roommate in graduate school. Ah, okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, I shared a lot about Ramana mm -hmm. Maharshi and his Argadatta, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. certain Zen masters with him, uh, dear being men, an amazingly talented psychotherapist, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, very well respected, and uh, mm -hmm. emerged years ago also as a very fine very balanced spiritual teacher. These dear beings who share from a place of true heart and uh, loving kindness and deep empathetic compassion. This is the wholesome, holy spirituality. It's not this mm -hmm. destructive, nihilistic, depersonalization disorder <laughs> inducing mm -hmm. pseudo Advaita or neo Advaita which is just very damaging and it comes from a wounded place, both the teachers mm -hmm. and the followers or listeners, you can sense they're all deeply wounded. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to make experience and world and relationships go away. Mm -hmm. So they become very nihilistic and teach this very unfortunate nihilistic doctrine of no person, no self. And it just generates apathy and depersonalization mm -hmm. disorder, zombie hood, you know, and everyone is, kind of laughing apparently in that movement, but it's a very sarcastic, mm -hmm. derogatory kind of laughter, mm -hmm. you know, and everyone feels ashamed of personhood because they have this model that mm -hmm. we must aspire to the impersonal reality. Well, that's false. Reality is supra personal and obviously is inclusive of all these gazillions mm -hmm. of persons and loves and sustains, animates, each and every sentient being or person. So the fact that this modern ideological reductionist nihilistic movement, hmm. which has usurped the great name of Advaita, and most of these teachers have no clue what the Upanishads actually say, what Lord Krishna actually taught, what the Buddha actually taught in the old Pali uh, language, canonical sutta literature. Most of them have no clue, or they've only just kindly dabbled mm. in not enough to get the balance that those traditions are presenting. And so they present as a presumed spokesperson, and there's a lot of arrogance often about it. I mean, it's just there. It's not who they absolutely are. It's not mm. who they are on the perfect level to pure mm. soul nature, but on this pragmatic level, mm. they've uh, just simply not had enough education. They've not been educare led out of ignorance. So they're ignorant mm. about the real roots and balancing principles of true non-duality. Mm. So mm. it gets taught in an imbalanced way. And that becomes very destructive when it tends toward this wholesale adopting of depersonalization with some misguided idea that they are thereby going to realize the impersonal, mm. absolute transcendent reality. It's, it's all imbalanced and skewed and ignorant, frankly, because they're ignoring divine imminence. Mm -hmm. They have some notion that there's some divine transcendence to be realized. And then it turns out the actual transcendence spoken about in Neo-Advaita or Pseudo-Advaita, it's not profound. It's so obvious uh, to this one that there's been no true awakening to the absolute, because if there were, there would be this spontaneous real love and real empathy mm. and real kindness and generosity. You wouldn't be plotting to get people on costly retreats and building up followers and publications created by your followers and everyone to uh, create some big movement and organization. Because uh, real spirituality is empowering, liberating. Mm. You don't need to pay money to me <laughs> to get you enlightened were awake. Ramana Maharshi, that was his gracious, supreme beauty, as he saw each and every one as the self, the divine self, utterly complete and whole and free intrinsically. And on the personality level, you know, the different psychological syndromes and shortcomings and, you know, minor or major pathologies, people could outgrow those. Ramana was convinced of this. He saw only the self. Mm -hmm. So he didn't have people lined up outside with people promoting him with publicity and charging, you know, 
100 rupees a head, <laughs> the rupee, the currency note of India. No, he didn't need or want anything from anyone. He only saluted them and bowed down directionlessly in all directions and no direction to their true infinite self. He saw them as the self. That's why people felt a wholesomeness and holiness around him and why they felt healed around him because he saw that you are intrinsically complete, mm. whole, not fragmented, not caught or stuck or unenlightened. Now on the pragmatic level, you could say the person is unenlightened, but mm. Ramana saw clearly level two and was abiding as level one, that there's only the self, only God. Who else could be here? What other reality could be doing and being everything and everyone? This is how this threefold mm. model is so profound, so liberating. Mm. It it is yeah it is a yeah very very helpful perspective and I myself I yeah it was difficult to navigate different um, experiences and um, I also in, looked into what you called as pseudo um, advaita and. It, it there was something missing but i didn't know but it but i didn't i didn't understand what it was and um when i bumped into your article it helped to kind of reference those experiences and also to understand better what i might be missing in uh in in terms of um uh navigating my experiences yeah so yeah timothy thank you so much for taking again so yeah so much time and also sharing your experiences and uh yeah channeling this wonderful godcast yeah <laughs> we've renamed the beyond perception podcast <laughs> as a God cast, which is beyond perception and yet <laughs> perceiving everything and everyone, all perceptions get included non duly. Yeah, the truly beyond, the truly transcendent is truly inclusive. Mm -hmm. And so, Simon and Brenda, his dear beloved, and Coco, their wonderful husky dog actually an angel in a fur suit <laughs> yes sir. and uh and simon are angels and female and male body suits earth suits it's all a divine perfection playing out it's only god only god only god All sorts of phenomena arise and vanish, breathing and feeling, perceiving, thinking, shimmering, pulsing of body-mind existence on physical and subtle levels. All these happenings happening in your vastness our true nature, the host nature for all these guests, the phenomena, personhood and worlds and events, interrelationships. How spectacular, how dreamlike. 
single reality, spiritual reality, Tao, the Brahman, the Godhead, <laughs> playing as all this, while also remaining utterly quiescent, clear, formless, prior to all worlds and beings. Everyone, the personal consciousness encounters or meets everyone in, quote, your life is transparent for the absolute divine reality and is this utterly pristine, pure, sweet, beautiful soul in the fullness of divine virtuous perfection. And is this precious, very poignant consciousness on the individual level associated with the body, mind, and all the stresses and challenges and joys and pleasures and pains What an amazing drama. It's tragic, comic drama, ultimately a divine comedy, because all beings wake up. All beings uh, are liberated from <laughs> their push personhood into the divine supra personal nature. No drama, this one who is prior to all dramas dreams up. Let this be clear, said Ramana Maharshi, and it's all over, but the gentle ease and laughing. <laughs> and sometimes there's tears and laughter, tears and laughter, and deep, deep peace. All right, it's dinner time for Simone, I think, with Brenda and Coco and mm -hmm. Brenda's mom and sister, maybe, all there. 
No, spirit. her sister is not here, but uh, in spirit. Yeah. yeah, in spirit. Yes. It's a joy hearing <laughs> Simone about mm. uh, Brenda family reunion with her mom and sister to all mm. be together. Yes. Yeah. In your home and town. This is beautiful. The miracle of family of beings that care for each other. And of course, spiritually, we wake up and all beings are our family members. Mm. And uh, they are God. There is only God. <laughs> <laughs> the self of all. The life of all lives. Thank you so much, Timothy. Thank you mm. for hosting <laughs> this mere phenomenal guest <laughs> on the Godcast. <laughs> Just a pea in the pod of Simone's podcast. <laughs> and we are the absolute. Namaste. Namaste. Namaskaram. Om Namo Shiva Shakti Namo. All hail the Supreme Brahman, Atman, Buddha Nature, Tao. So, oh divine host, going by the name <laughs> Simon. You will have to disappear this, vanish it, like all the vanishing moments. Moments arise, they vanish. Situations arise, very precious, poignant, very dear. And fellow company, so precious and poignant. And they vanish. All in the great wholeness and completeness of the divine. Purnam, 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 the fullness, fullness of divine perfection. In other words, this is a cue you can you can end the podcast, the Godcast, and return to just being the Godhead. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Timothy. You're welcome, and, there, Simon. Uh, we shall see each other. Yeah. Again, we are unseeable in our <laughs> essence. Yet these dear forms and the technology, the miracle technology of Zoom, allow us to be seeable. Yeah. Another miracle. <laughs> all around miracles. And the yeah, Tim drama. Timothy, all the best. Um, yeah, for for your busy schedule and uh, mm. for the move and um, yeah, the, 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 I, I mean, the, the, you don't need to take care of it. I, I, I understand. <laughs> the <Yeah>. single shakti, <laughs> as I say, the one doer, the one doer. Otherwise, again, Timothy would be utterly exhausted and flat and probably dead. Uh, the next time we, we gather by Zoom, my wife Laura and I will be living a bit closer to my stepdaughter and our grandchildren. We did not get to build the house right next door that we were hoping prices have become so inflationary and so crazy. It would have been madness to continue. So we found a little mountain town called Clarkdale, about 32 minutes drive west of Sedona, where my stepdaughter and our grandchildren live. Hmm. And uh, we bought a house there. So uh, it's a little mountain town, very close to a lot of beautiful nature trails mm -hmm. and the Verde River flows four minutes away. Nice. And uh, that's where you'll see me next. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then, if yeah. Timothy is even around. <laughs> In any case, we're always one with each other, we, mm. in our essence, we are interpenetrated as the self same beautiful mm. reality. And that goes for every being we meet, mm. every being we know. Enjoy thyself, O self. Mm.